Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to first start by thanking IPGA for inviting me to come and speak on the United States crop. Um, as well, I'd like to thank Madam Shakun, who works so hard for U.S. pulses into the India region, and Jeff Rumney from U.S. Dry Pea and Lentil Association, who's here with us today as well. Uh, as he said, I'm with Columbia Grain. I'm the CEO and president of Columbia Grain, and I've been involved in trade to India for about 15 years now. Um, maybe it'll, there we go. So give you a little bit of a background on Columbia Grain. We're about the largest pulse handling company in the United States. We're a 42-year-old company and we're a subsidiary of Marabini America Corporation. We're headquartered in Portland, Oregon, we have about 320 employees. We have nine processing facilities across the span of Washington, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota for handling peas, lentils, uh, dry beans as well. And upon that, we also are a big wheat, corn, soybean company, and we export a, a lot of bulk vessel into this region as well from time to time. One of the things about the United States with a lot of its pulse production is it's really concentrating more on quality as opposed to quantity. We have a lot of areas that are primarily branded products for green peas, lentils, uh, split peas, products like that, as well as our dry beans. You can see from uh, the area where, where Columbia Grain is at across the northern tier and where all of our facilities are on the map on the top there. And below, some of these brands are things that people that have been in the industry a long time are probably familiar with as when Columbia Grain acquired Heart Brand, it was one of the most popular U.S. green pea brands into India. I'll start by giving you a little bit of background on U.S. pulses and where they've come from. Everybody talks about the large expansion of acres that has taken place across the world and the U.S. is all the same. So if you look at where dry peas were grown in the United States in 1995, it was primarily only in the Pacific Northwest and it was concentrated on dry green peas. Back in 95, we produced 220,000 tons of, of peas and flip ahead to um, maybe, to 2019, and you can see the large expansion that the United States has had, where we're growing them virtually everywhere in the United States now. But what happened back in 2005 when the Farm Bill came about that started providing support pricing for pulse growers is that they really moved into the Montana and North Dakota area, and that's where the majority of our production is today, and you can see Fifteen years later, we're growing over a million metric tons of peas now, and it's split uh, probably around 70-30 between yellow peas and green peas. Lentil region is much the same. Back in 1995, out in Washington, Idaho, in the Palouse is where we grew all of our lentils. At that time, we were growing primarily pardinas and regular lentils that went specifically to Spain and some into South America. You had very little bit of production in 1995, and that actually is about when Columbia Grain opened up its first processing facility in Montana. But we were only producing 100,000 tons of lentils at that point in time. And again, as we go into 2019, you can see that most of the area is expanded into the Montana, North Dakota region, which is kind of right below the Saskatchewan area. We've seen large increases. In 2019, we raised about 300,000 tons of lentils. We've had years up closer to 600,000 tons as well. With the lower prices the last couple of years, our farmers have looked at other options instead of lentils. But now you will see, instead of just pardina and regs, we'll grow primarily richly medium green lentils, which has been a great opportunity to come down to India. 
As well, we're growing about 50,000 tons of red lentils a year and some estin and some, and some uh, laird as well. Chickpeas. The United States really wasn't a big chickpea grower. 20,000 tons in 1995, mostly in California at that point in time, with a little bit spread around in the Palouse. Well, it's kind of amazing what uh, $2,000 chickpeas will do. And farmers in Montana and North Dakota who used to grow a lot of peas and lentils at that point in time, well, that's really what brought a lot of farmers into, into growing pulses was the $2,000 chickpeas. And so the last couple of years, you've seen a big explosion of chickpea acres. What, what the United States was really known for through most of the early 2000s were its Sierra white 9 millimeter chickpeas when it came to the export market. But the reality of it was up, up until about two or three years ago, we were really a net importer of chickpeas as opposed to an exporter. Now with the large expansion we've had, and we still have a lot of product left from the last two to three years, we're exporting a lot more. You can see that in most regions we grow primarily the large versus small chickpeas. We, have, we do see out in Washington and Idaho where those guys are concentrating a lot with the hummus companies and so they're growing a lot of smaller chickpeas because the hummus companies want the cheapest chickpea that they can get. I'll talk a little bit about where we're exporting to with our dry peas. You can see India has been a huge market for dry peas once we started growing a lot of yellow peas. And so through time we were exporting a lot to India, both green and yellow, but you can see what's happened in the last two years it's really been reduced. You can also see that, that China was a big importer of peas from the United States, primarily green peas. And it's, it's kind of ironic that now that China has put a 30% tariff on U.S. peas, that Canada has become a very big market for U.S. peas while China's gone down. There might be some displacement of, of peas there and the flow that they're taking based upon trade wars. Um, the Philippines is a big market for us, as well on green peas, Mexico, and you see a lot of uh, government donation business, that's the Yemen, Ethiopia uh, type of markets for us as well. Where do we export our lentils to? Again, you can see, because we grow so many uh, medium green, richly lentils, India had been a very big market for them, the south part of India. The Spain market is primarily a, uh, a Pardina lentil area, and uh, Mexico can be an Estin or a, a medium green, richly lentil as well. Peru, Colombia, Sudan kind of takes all kinds of, the Sudan is government business, but. Peru and Colombia takes all kinds of different varieties for us. Um, I always like to, to note that you, know, you see what happens. Canada is a big producer of lentils, but they import a lot of lentils from the United States, which I always find strange, and a lot of people know my political convictions about some of that. But um, three years ago, it was primarily because of a quality issue that they would import a lot of U.S. lentils up there to blend with the Canadian lentils because they had quality problems on their lairds. This year, it might be because there's a 22% higher tariff for U.S. lentils into India than there is for Canadian lentils. So you're seeing uh, U.S. lentils again move up into India, probably moving this direction as Canadian lentils. And our chickpea markets, when we are exporting, you see big growth into the Spain market over the last couple of years. This year particularly, you see, because we're growing so many more Frontier and Orion style chickpeas in Montana, uh, you're seeing a lot of that mixed caliber type of market going into the Pakistan market. 
Turkey's been a good market for us, although this year it's down substantially because of the Russian chickpeas that are going into Turkey. And we do kind of steady business into the Mediterranean Gulf with ours. But really, the United States is consuming a lot of its own chickpeas now. As long as I'm here, we should talk about you know, what's the history of US pulses and India. And you can see a large percentage of what we were doing were in the dry pea markets. The 2015, 16, 17 years are when, you know, where we were shipping almost 200,000 tons of primarily yellow peas to India. And that's when we were managing to do a lot of bulk vessels this direction so we can move them fast. Probably about 30% of that is the green peas that were coming here as well. We did some minor, smaller portions of bulk vessel uh, lentils into the south part of India as well. Chickpeas were kind of a steady product, but primarily a branded product that came into this marketplace. And with your smaller crops in 2016-17 is when the United States moved a lot more into the Indian market. But with the fact that we have higher tariffs on our lentils into India, peas aren't allowed any longer, and chickpeas have the high, Im high import tariffs, you won't see a lot of our U.S. product going here. What I would say is that I'm hoping my good friend, Mr. Trump, when he comes here, can solve some of these problems and we can get tariffs equalized with the other countries so we're able to ship more product this way again. We do have good quantities of red lentils as well as good quality of both red lentils and green lentils. Kind of wanted to touch just for a second on some of the dry beans we do. The United States is a large producer of dry beans as well. Pinto beans, black beans, a lot of kidney beans. Sometimes those will come into this marketplace as well. Um, some adzuki beans, great northern beans, and navy beans spread out throughout the United States. North Dakota is the largest producing dry bean state in the United States. One of the things that we had with our crop in the, in the bean market this year was we were a very wet spring, and then we had kind of an early winter. So our growing season was short, so we ended up with a lot of problems to our primarily our uh, white bean crops a lot of high moisture, a lot of damage to them, and the crop, a lot of acres just didn't get harvested this year. And if you look at where we're looking at for U.S. and Canadian Indian stocks on pinto beans this year, you'll see it's going to be about zero. They will pretty well all be sold out this year. So a product that had been trading at about $750 a ton and had a hard time finding markets outside of the United States and Mexico today is trading for about $1,300. We're also a large producer of black beans. Again, we had a lot of damage in our black bean crop. So where we normally have been trading, holding at about 1.2 million metric tons of carryover stocks, this year we'll be down there about one. And navy beans are another crop this year that we had a lot of damage to our navy bean crop. So virtually what's gonna be left is almost unusable type of product, only canning not necessarily packaging type of product available. So looking at the crop, to generalize our crop of peas in 2019, the FAQ levels of our crop were number one across both the Montana and the PNW region. Um, we produced just a little over a million metric tons of peas. We had relatively large carryover stocks, so we're carrying a supply of about 1.3 million metric tons. We're going to export about 350,000 tons of that, primarily green peas and or USDA split yellow peas. But where you really see growth coming in the United States is in the domestic market. One of the things that, that we've seen going on around the world has to do with your plant-based proteins. And what drove us to where we are today in our domestic demand has been pet foods, believe it or not. So as all of, you know, adults, 
get into this gluten-free and healthier foods, they expect their pets to be the same way. And so now if you go across the grocery stores in the United States and you're shopping for your pet food, most of them say non-grain, gluten-free, all those types of things because they're consuming so much of our yellow peas and chickpeas to use as protein into pet foods. Two years ago when, when uh, chickpeas were trading for $2,000, we were trading splits and chips for $1,200 to pet food manufacturers because they wanted the protein and the water absorption that came with the chickpea when you put it into a pet food. So we're, you know, as I've gone around and done some of these shows with U.S. Dry Pea and Little and gone to places like Pakistan, and they try to say, well, you guys just need to drop your prices and we'd buy a lot more of your yellow peas. We don't really need a yellow pea market because we're consuming so many of them in the United States now into pet foods. But you're also going to see a lot more in the way of proteins and flowers come about in the United States as well. Lentil supply and demand. Past few years, and, and this year part of the problem too was that we had a late season. We were, had a, a really wet spring, so getting product in the ground was difficult this year. But price, lower prices have pushed farmers away from growing the lentils as well. You can see back in 2017 when uh, lentil markets, green lentil markets were trading near $1,000. We put a lot of acres in the ground. And that's backed off primarily because the chickpea acreage grew in our region. And, uh, but so production has been down a little bit over the last two years. We still have been carrying big stocks though because of, we grow so many richlies and the major market for them was India and not being able to export here as much has really brought our carryover stocks up. But you can see that with what we grew this year and a much stronger export market into the European, Mediterranean, uh, North Africa and South American markets, we're finally kind of getting rid of some of our stocks and we'll have relatively tight supplies after this year. Chickpeas, got plenty of them. There's for sale signs up everywhere. The farmers have been carrying a lot of them. We would have thought that we would have seen a much bigger reduction last year, but the funny thing about it, these farmers have been carrying so many chickpeas around, they kind of, I think, look at it as having free seed in their bin. So when the spring came last year, they kept on seeding chickpeas. So we still had big carryover stocks. Again, we've been selling a lot of them as a mixed quality in the $550 to $600 range into the Pakistan market. Um, over the course of the last year. One of the things about the chickpeas from the United States is as we've increased, we do see a lot more of the smooth style Frontier Orion type of production. So the reality of it is, is our, into the export market, the nine millimeter Sierras, we're actually very tight on those, uh, those products. The other thing that I would say I've seen over the course of the last four years, $2,000 chickpeas change a lot of things. And a lot of the canning uh, players in the world were a nine or a 10 millimeter buyer. And when chickpeas went to $2,000, they became an eight and seven millimeter buyer. And today they're continuing to try to want to buy a lot of eight millimeters. But our, nine, our Sierra product is about 85% nine millimeter. So it's been difficult to, to kind of fulfill a lot of those markets because we have, usually have bigger quality, bigger size on our product. Um, but I think what you're gonna see with carryover stocks, what we have for ending stocks, that's mostly gonna be more of an Orion Frontier style, mostly a seven, eight, little bit of nine style. The, the more branded nine millimeter product is gonna be in short supply this year and gonna be in even shorter supply next year as a lot of growers are gonna go away from chickpeas primarily in the Palouse region where they grow a lot of that this year. Here's a little bit of a look at the growth of pulses in the United States. 
And if you take this all the way back to 2012, actually, you'll see that the use of pulses in the United States was closer to 100,000 tons. So in just a few short years, we've brought ourselves up to over 900,000 tons of use in, in primarily the pet food part of the blue field piece section of that, but there's also more consumption of lentils and more consumption of chickpeas and going towards hummus and to pet foods. As I said, for a lot of things, we are an importer. Um, you're going to find that I think over the next couple of years, the United States is going to be a net importer of yellow peas as we drive for more protein use, and that will come primarily from Canada. So with just the last minute I've got, one of the things that we as a company do every year and try to figure out what's the farmer going to grow this coming year, and we put together what we believe to be close estimations of where prices are going to be and take a look at the farmer's costs and figure out what's going to return the most to him because our farmers are actually really good and adaptable to planning what's going to give them the best return. And you can see it, today in Montana, it looks like malt, barley, and flax are the big crops, but I can tell you that the demand for those is, is kind of limited and, and those guys you know, will only take so much. So the reality of it is, is that lentils still look good for a grower in Montana. And you can see at the very end of there, chickpeas are about the worst crop that he can grow this year. And that would tell you that you're going to see a reduction in the number of chickpea acres in our primary growing areas. So if I look at it, I would say as the world's tightening, Mexico's got some problems, the U.S. is going to be lower, Canada probably is steady to sideways, maybe slightly lower. I would look for a more bullish market into the chickpea side of things, and green lentil market probably is going to be a little bit more bullish as well as the Pardina market going forward. So with that, that's what I've got to present today, and if anybody has any questions about the U.S. situation, I'd be glad to answer them.